I would like to take a moment and just take it all in. To the graduates gathered here this morning, to the board of the African Leadership University, the CEO in absentia and founder of the group in absentia, to the faculty and the teaching staff, to the parents and the support structures of each and every single one of the graduates gathered here today, but most importantly to the wonderful nation and the people of Rwanda who've given us a home. Good morning. When is the future? Is perhaps the question we should obsess ourselves with this morning. When is the future? To each and every single one of you, the young people gathered here who are graduating, the certificates that you will now no doubt hang on your walls and the journey you're about to embark on as you get into your professional lives and adulthood and the rest of the big bad world as it is. As a young African, you will often hear the question that you are the future. But the question I'd like for you to contend with is this, when is the future? I came to tell you today about a story of a people, a people whose history is marked in the pages. It tells a story of resilience and triumph, a story of trial and tribulation, but a people who, regardless of the challenges they faced, always carried the most important currency of our time today, hope. Hope that tomorrow would be better than today and faith, faith that the efforts they were putting in would yield the results they desired. I came to tell you today that you are in the darkest continent on this little rock we call Earth. And so when we talk about leadership and the future, different to our companions, friends, and partners from other parts of the world, we don't have the luxury of waiting for a decade or two. Our future is this very moment. And so the education we receive, the networks we build, the relationships we create as we grow and morph and go into the professional world, all of those are to be used for the future. And the question is, when is the future? I want to argue here today that the future is now. And so I'm going to be quite contrarian to and so if you will allow me, I'm going to be quite contrarian to what I believe is probably the message you would have heard for much of your academic life. This idea that there is a journey you must embark on still and at some point into the future, you will be given the platform, the opportunity, the door to walk in and exercise your full rights and talents. I'm here to tell you today as a fellow young African, that door won't be opened. Those opportunities will not be laid ajar. You are gonna to have to force open that door and to create those opportunities, not only for yourself, but for the entire generation on whose shoulders we stand. Because for each of us in this room, each and every single one of us, there is in equal measure 100 other young capable Africans Glorious in their melanin as you are. Beautiful and tall as you all are. But without the opportunity to sit where you're sitting. And perhaps then the greatest challenge for us to contend with is that we're here indeed because of our own work and all the rest of it, but we're also here because we won 
a lottery ticket, the DNA of life that gave you the opportunity to walk the journey you've walked and to be in this room. In his magnum opus, Things Fall Apart, the grandfather of African literature and one of my favorite authors, Chinua Achebe, says that it is not until lions have their own historians that the story of the hunt will glorify the hunter. Now this proverb, while wildly used, is actually often misquoted. People say it is not until lions tell their own story. That's not what the proverb says. It says it's not until lions have their own historians that the story of the hunt will glorify the hunter. And so the question in this room is who amongst us are the lions and who amongst us are the historians? Because this beautiful continent we call home, that is home to over one billion people, has had a challenge not only of lions, but also a challenge of historians. The narrative and the messaging about this continent, the Africa rising, well, I wanna ask the question, if Africa is rising, are Africans rising? So each of us are differently abled we're gifted by the good Lord differently. Our mandates are different. The assignment you've been put on this little rock called Earth is yours and yours alone. But for both the lions and the historians, the question is, will you play your part? So who are the lions? Well, the lions are those who are going to dare to walk out of this room and go into the big bad world and break down the doors. The lions are those of you that will go into industries that you believe to be archaic and look for opportunities to reform those industries, transform those industries, and bring a new fresh wave of thinking into those industries. The lions are those of you who will go back home and look at perhaps your political structures and system of governance and say, there is a better way to do this yet. But for each of those, there are amongst us those who must tell the story of what's being done. My own view, just from a sample of one, is that Africa's greatest challenge is the story she believes about herself. And so yours and my question as we go into the world and lead is how are we going to rewrite the story of how Africans believe in themselves how do we take the african success story and make it a path of the course not the exception to the program how do we take the africans that go and dominate globally and make that a part of who we are rather than a standout outlier of the place from which we come but more than this how do we build an africa where africans can build the future of africa and listen to this, from Africa. But there's three things, if you will allow me, that I'd like to share. First, and to the graduating class this morning, When Devin and I had a conversation, he was briefing me about this. He was telling me all about the academic program and the rigor and what you've gone through. And I kept having this persistent thought in my mind, and so I thought I'd share it with you. And here is the thought. The world doesn't have a curriculum. Reality doesn't follow an Excel spreadsheet. And so a part of what's going to determine your success in the world is the ability to exist in a world that doesn't follow the program that you're familiar with. And so the first question I want you to ask yourself, and this is the first thing I wanted to share with you, is how willing, ready, and able are you to fail? Because the only way we push our continent forward is if we constantly push the boundaries. Now, if it is new, it can't be right. And if it's done right all the time, it's definitely not new. How capable, willing, and able are we to fail? And are you ready to fail? 
We love celebrating successes. But I hope and wish one day that we would also throw parties to celebrate failures. And I mean failures of people who did something daring, people who dared to venture into the world and think about things differently. To acknowledge them and say, it's not necessarily the outcome that matters, but the fact that you have the courage to go upon this endeavor. In my world of venture capital, that's the single most important ingredient in any startup founder and entrepreneur when you're looking to back them. It's not their education, although that's important. It's not how well they can build a pitch deck, although that's cool too. Believe it or not, it isn't even how well they use the Queen's language, or whether or not they can wax lyrical. What you look for is the single most important ingredient is that they failed. Because the minute you embark on that journey, nothing will give you a slap like life. Not even the slap we saw a week ago. And so the question is, are you ready to go into the world and to test the boundaries? Are you ready to fail? The second thing I wanted to share with you this morning. A week ago, I turned 37. I'm still having heart palpitations about this. I was 18 just the other day. I really was. Just the other day, I was 18 years old. Then I was 20. I was the cool 20-year-old. Look at me, 6'2", tall, chocolate, Zulu. Bam! I look at me in the mirror and I'm like, bam! Uh, sorry to the older people. Just the other day, and even though it's 37, I've been thinking about the incredible journey God has had me on. If there is one thing I would change, it's this. I would have done more, and I would have done it sooner. But I was socialized into an environment that taught me that there are age-appropriate things, and only certain things you do at a certain age. But some of you in this room are gifted differently, and you will be called into your purpose long before the age for that purpose is ripe by society's standard. And I want to tell you that if that happens, whatever you do, you listen to your God, your creator, you do not listen to society. Because society, ladies and gentlemen, because society, ladies and gentlemen, it is many things. But an acceptor of exceptionalism is not one of them. If you think about it, society is nothing more than a system of normalized averages. And so if you accept that you are neither normal nor average, then you have to accept that you're on a collision course with society from day one. And I want to encourage each and every single one of you that as you embark on this journey on your life and you're in this collision course with society, at every instance of friction, rather than ask yourself what's wrong with you, ask yourself the question, what's right with me that the friction is coming to? We have a big job ahead of us. As a generation, we have a big job ahead of us. A big job of electrifying our continent and bringing power to households. A big job of creating industries and giving jobs that bring dignity to a people. A big job of liberating our politics so that every single African, no matter where they're born, has a fair shot at life. All of us, each and every single one of us, we have a big job. And if we're going to take on this task, we're going to have to get ready for a bit of friction with society. I say this to you because I know that in the not so distant future, you will remember this conversation. I say this to you because when I started having my frictions with society it was the people that counseled me to help me understand the spiritual journey I was on. And the third and final thing, not usually something you'd hear from a keynote speaker at a graduation ceremony, but it is this. The most important element about your leadership journey is who you lead with and how much fun you have along the way.
And so as you get into the world, I pray for you that you have the spirit of discernment to surround yourself with people who are equal to the task and call to the same mandate that you are, so that you lead with a caliber and a cater of people who elevate you and elevate the cause. But not only this, I pray for you that when the moments come, you're able to really take a deep breath, slow it down and sip it all in and say, this is the moment to enjoy the fruits of my labor. For those of us who read the good news and the good book, we know that in six days, our Lord God created on earth. And what did he do on the seventh day? Yeah, he took a nap. He, he took a nap. He took some sleeping pills and he took a nap. And so there has come a time and an opportunity for you to rest. You must take that a time and an opportunity for you to take a moment and a deep breath. Take that. Have fun along the journey. I arc back to that beautiful proverb by Chinua Achebe. Not until lions have their own historians, that until that story is told, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And so to the lions in this room, those of you who will go into the world, and push boundaries, challenge conventional thinking, argue your position, be fastidious and determined, respectfully, but always clear and deliberate. To each and every single one of you, I pray upon your life, courage at this time. And to those of you who will go out into the world and become the historians, those who help us see ourselves differently, those who will tell the story and capture the narrative, those who will help us reframe what this word Africa means, and what that word Africans means to each and every single one of you. I hope that when, not if, you see a lion fall, you will tell them the story about their glory and not the story about the fall. We live in an insidious time in the world today where if you want something to trend, just make it and say it positive, say it negative. We live in an insidious time today where bad news takes the elevator, good news always takes the stairs. And so the question for you and I as a generation is how are we going to use these tools of communication to change the narrative of how we see ourselves and how we see each other? I'd like to leave you with this. Many years ago, I had the incredible privilege of meeting the father of our own country and our democracy, Nelson Mandela. I just won the world championship in public speaking and I was invited to come and meet him. And I went and spent an afternoon with him. And I'll, I'll never forget the day I was 17 at the time, I was still in high school. And it was during school holidays and my mother sent me to go and meet Nelson Mandela wearing school uniform during school holidays. Black mothers, ne? They are here in the room, they know themselves. If you are not laughing, you are the black mother we are talking about right now. Isn't it interesting, one of the things I love about who we are and our experience as a people, isn't it interesting how there are just certain things that are who we are regardless of where in the continent you find us. The spirit of how we welcome people is who we are, no matter where in the continent you find us. The spirit of no matter how downtrodden we are, every single day we have a smile of hope is a spirit of who we are. Our ability to, yeah, our ability to jingle and make music and dance is who we are, no matter where in the continent you find us. And yes, let it be clear, South Africans are the best dancers in the continent, bar none. I don't want to argue about this. We can take a poll. You all, you all know this. You all know this now. To the older people, you all can sit this one out. But to the young people, you all know. South Africans, we know how to get down. This is a fact. That's who we are. I had this incredible privilege to meet Nelson Mandela. And um, my mother sending me to the meeting, she gave me three instructions. These are still the same three instructions, by the way, that I repeat in my head every time I get up on the platform. 
just after I say a silent prayer, the three instructions my mother gave me was this. Look smart, sound intelligent, and don't embarrass me. Really the mandate I imagine from your parents here today as you go out into the world is look smart, sound intelligent, and whatever you do, do not bring dishonor upon this family and our surname. And I decided the only way to do this was if during the entire course of my conversation with Udata, I said nothing, but I asked really good questions. I learned in that moment that people always remember the person who asks the most intelligent questions. They care far less for the one who believes they have the intelligent answers. And so perhaps the challenge for you and I then as we build our continent is what questions are we asking about our future? What questions are we asking about our leadership? What questions are we asking about our civilization, about our generation? What questions are we asking? Because the quality of the questions we ask infers upon us the quality of the answers we come up with. And so we're over an hour into the meeting asking really smart questions, but I mean really smart questions. And towards the end of the meeting, his assistant knocked at the door, opened the door and peeked her head. 17 year old boy at the time, I didn't know what this meant today. As a business person and mildly successful executive, I know that that's code for you need to end this meeting. So he looked at me just after Zelda had peeked her head and shut the door again. And he looked at me and he said, you know, they said uh, you are a speaker. And I said to him, yeah, but Dada is a closer word for granddad. And he looked at me and he said, but man, you have not spoken. You just ask a question and a question. Then he looked at me. And he said to me, before we finish, and I've really enjoyed our time today, have you got uh, any final questions? So I asked him this question, and it is a question I will ask you. I said to him, Dada, what is your hope for the future of South Africa? And the question I have for you today is what is your hope for the future of Africa? And what is your hope for the future of Africans? And he looked at me and he looked down. In classical public speaking, by the way, one of the things you're taught is to infer a lot by where a person positions their eyes. If someone looks down to the left or to the right, generally they're getting into the part of the brain where they're processing the information you're giving them in search for a good answer for that information. He takes a moment, he looks down, then he looks back at me and he says the following. He said, South Africans need a little bit of hope, eh? and they need their faith. And so I asked him the question and I will ask it to you. I said, Tata, what is faith? Faith, he says, is there the ability to see the invisible. It is the ability to trust in the unknown. And so the question I have for you and I is do we have faith? Class of 2018, graduates, young men and women, soon to be captains of commerce, leaders of economies, civil society, educators congratulations on this journey and no matter where life takes you always have faith ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for the invitation to be here always thank you